Okay, guys, I think we've got it. We've yearned for a Top Gear about railways for decades, and I can tell you right here and now, such a program exists. At least it did back in 1958. Railway Roundabout was the collaborative effort of the BBC, British Railways, and two enthusiasts, Patrick Whitehouse and John Adams. The idea was to create a topical education program for young railway enthusiasts of the day, so initially intended for children, but eventually adults would begin to cotton onto the idea. It came about by coincidence over time. Whitehouse and Adams met at the Tanith Lynn Railway in the early 1950s and subsequently began making some films together. Adams's neighbour at the time happened to be the head of the BBC for the Midlands, who was interested in seeing Adams's collaborative work with Whitehouse. The interest eventually led to a meeting with the head of children's entertainment, who would give them a commission for further work on BBC One. The show ran for five years, from 1958 to 1962, featuring pre-recorded films looking at all aspects of railway operation and development at that time, year by year. Each year broadcast around 10 programmes at 25 minutes in length, and the films themselves were linked together live in a studio environment. So that's where that idea came from. Though to be fair, the technology didn't allow them to pre-record the show at the time of transmission, but the emphasis was placed more on the contents of the films themselves rather than the live links in between. Thankfully, Railway Roundabout was much better than Train Spotting Live, as in, it catered specifically to the railway enthusiast market, rather than patronised an audience it didn't seem entirely sure about. When it was on the air, the small team of dedicated maniacs would showcase the operation of express trains and branches, shed visits, railway closures, the latest in modern traction, signal operation, standard and narrow gauge systems, early preserved railways, preserved locomotives, and preservation societies with special trains hauled by some of the oldest engines left in operation, not just in Britain, but in Europe as well. There are many nostalgic looks back at times gone by on the railway DVD market, but this particular series demonstrates just how railways changed in that five-year period. So many of the branches and secondary routes featured on the show, like the Seven and Y, the Somerset and Dorset, the Hales Owen and so on, have either closed or were closing down at the time they were featured. Despite all the films presumably being shown in black and white at the time, as the BBC didn't start broadcasting in colour until 1967, a lot of the films were shot on colour film from as early as 1956. If you were a young enthusiast who was just growing out of the railway series and was yearning to find out more about the real thing, calm down, that wasn't meant as a stab, then this was the show for you. Here was scope to introduce you to all sorts of railway aspects going on at the time. It's not exactly a race against time from Land's End to John O'Groats by Steam, but this was the 50s, a much slower, more leisurely time. And being a product of such a time, this was primarily for young enthusiasts who went out of their way to collect numbers. It was a thing back then, don't ask me why. So many of the films were just montages of watching the trains go by at stations. There was also a few films looking at the very latest in modernisation, including rides aboard some of the newest DMUs, a feature on the Blue Pullman, York's modern control box, and so on. The ongoing theme of the show seemed to be, this is where we've come from and this is where we're going. The relationship between the production crew and British Railways inevitably started on unstable ground, but settled as time went by. A good example of this is the production of a double-headed Glen special on the West Highland mainline to Fort William. When the crew asked VR Scottish Region to provide two locos over two days, a footplate pass and transport for the lineside cameraman, VR turned the crew away, to which the team said they'll just go and film something on the Western Region instead. This must have been taken as a threat because 24 hours later everything was arranged and the rest is history. Oh, the Western. Even British Rail loved to hate you, didn't they? Such was the dedication of Pat and John, they both had full-time careers and made this programme in whatever spare time they had. Sound familiar? And the efforts they would go to spoke wonders for the sake of the rail fan community. Filming the Ravenglass and Estale on a trip from Birmingham in those days necessitated driving along roads before the M6 motorway had been built. But planning, driving and filming were only three jobs these two did. They were also researchers, editors, scriptwriters and presenters. Again, sound familiar? And not everything went according to plan behind the scenes. The Jones Goods on the Carl of LaColche route took over two years to plan, film, edit and broadcast due to the engine breaking down on its first outing in 1960. I could make the comparisons all day, I really could. This ended up being far from a hobby. While certainly an interest, it still justified the BBC paying the crew for their troubles. After all, no artist should work for nothing. So why can't we make Railway Roundabout now? 
I mean, we live in a thriving world of railway activity where new developments, technology and locomotion are appearing year after year all over the world, right? Right? I suppose the timing was a big part of Railway Roundabout's success. In the revisited compilation, the final film, which was never broadcast, shows trains climbing Shap Fell on the West Coast Main Line in 1963, and the unkempt and grimy conditions of the locomotives tells you everything you need to know about that period. The nation was falling out of love with its railways. The reason for the great British public to celebrate them over cars, jet airliners and Beatlemania suddenly wasn't there. Not only that, but who would publish his infamous report in 1963? By that time, political and cultural attitudes to railways began to change in the same way that audiences began to change. And ever since, we just continue to either look back or look forward at our railways, as the here and now of railways isn't quite so interesting compared to the here and now of the people who work on railways. At least as far as mainstream television seems concerned. What's more, there's a whole minefield of health and safety that's got to be tippy-toed around just to shoot close-ups of a loco standing in the mainline depot. The thought of Network Rail casually giving free rein to a small film crew is impossible to imagine, but one can still dream. In short, guys, while it's easy to think of what could happen today, Railway Roundabout could only have existed at this specific period when railways were something of a thing in popular culture, but were slowly beginning to go out of fashion the last period when all schoolboys wanted to be engine drivers. And thank God it did exist at this time, because if it started broadcasting five years later, then there could have been no public recordings of the two glens on the West Highland main line, the closure of the Seven and Y network, the North London tank on Hopton Incline, the Adams radial at Lyme Regis, the introduction of the Blue Pullman, the two Irish narrow gauge lines featured in 1958, and the only known video recordings of this viaduct inspection unit and a UK slip coach in action. The Bluebell Railway coverage that was shown in 1962 featured the preparation of a mainline Bluebell special about to head out on British Rail's Arding Line Haywards Heath connection, which closed a year later. So, yeah, they shot some unique stuff which we'll never see again. But hey, look on the bright side. They shot some unique stuff. What we have left is a one-of-a-kind collection of historical accounts showing us how things were in great detail. Pat and John held the copyright to their work, which later allowed the main films to be preserved in the National Collection. This gave the NRM the opportunity to release the majority of the films on compilation home videos in the early 1990s, so that a whole new audience could enjoy them. Sure, it's not the same with Peter Woods' commentary or the overdubbed sound that doesn't quite match up in various places, but the live broadcasts were during a time when television wasn't seen as a long-term form of entertainment, and the initiative to record and preserve such television history wasn't taken as seriously as it is now, hence the lack of recordings from that period by comparison. This was a time when pre-recorded TV shows were usually shown twice and then their tapes were wiped and reused. Hence why most of Dad's Army Series 2, a good number of the early Doctor Who episodes, and some of the Likely Lads shows are still missing presumed lost altogether. What's left of Railway Roundabout is good enough for us to enjoy in a whole new way, transforming its legacy from topical showcasing of the period to historical documentation and reference of a time we all love replicating today. Long and short, everybody, Railway Roundabout is a must-have for anyone interested in railways, or at a push social history from montages of station activities to first-hand accounts of the latest traction at the time. There's something there for everybody. The whole series is available on DVD, and if you haven't checked it out already, by all means do, because right now, it's the closest thing a rail fan can get to Top Gear. Okay, so there's no head-to-head -head challenges, or celebrity cameos, or middle-aged men falling over and catching fire, but it still hits the rail fan bullseye much more accurately than any modern equivalent. Any modern equivalent. I'm Chris, and I'm here to gauge the issue.